Thank you, Naomi. <clears throat> Naomi, how was the Thanksgiving Day dinner here at the church? Oh, that's wonderful. So glad to hear that. Thank you for coordinating that. Well, grace, peace, and mercy be to you from the Lord our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The message today will reflect on Thanksgiving weekend and on Christ the King Sunday, which is today, the end of the uh, church calendar year. Now, Pastor Greg concluded his series last Sunday and will begin his Advent series next week, the first Sunday in Advent. But before we get into the message, I want, first of all, to say that Patty and I are still having grandchildren. <laughs> this is last six weeks, Numbers 10 and Numbers 11 came. Okay. And here locally, our son Ryan, his wife Tara Lee, uh, five weeks early, delivered little Esme Dawn We Met. And then, a week late, in Salt Lake City, Angela and uh, her husband Jeremiah birthed little Judah Randall Johnston. So, uh, we've been on the road again, and we just got back a little over a week ago. We were in Salt Lake City and then in Texas with our son Eric. And uh, so we are very blessed this last week to have Christine and her family with us for Thanksgiving. They have been living for 12 years in Hong Kong, teaching at the Christian school there, but now they live in Reading. So the children were born in Hong Kong. This is the very first Halloween our, our Hong Kong kids have ever had, and the very first Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving here. So it was a really wonderful time with them. Uh, last June, when I last um, was here as guest pastor, subbing for Pastor Greg, uh, at the beginning of the sermon, I shared some fun photos of signs and pictures that I've seen while we're traveling around the Midwest. And uh, so I have two more from our travels. So this one, this one comes from a fruit and vegetable stand outside Story City, Iowa. And this one... <laughs> I don't know if you can read that. It says, it makes me look like I'm paying attention when I drink coffee. <laughs> it makes me look like I'm paying attention. And uh, I thought that was so funny. And then the next one, of all places, this is in Salt Lake City. This is in a bakery cafe. It's right above the coffee making machine. And this one says, I'll have a cafe, mocha, vodka, Xanax latte to go, please. <laughs> <laughs> but in Salt Lake City, that's pretty amazing. Anyway, <laughs> so I asked for one. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I said, I was going to wait for the, the grandkids to be born. No, that's great. It was wonderful. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to share those. Uh, I guess that one's going to have to stay up there for a little bit. <laughs> our, the theme of the message this morning is our greatest thanks for our greatest king. The modern festivals of Thanksgiving, which is the fourth Thursday of the month of November, and Christ the King Sunday, which is the finale Sunday, the last Sunday, the finale of the liturgical church calendar year, they both share origins that were born in grief, strife, and a lot of angst. Both call us to a deeper living and a deeper faith, and to have a spirit of reverent thanks to the divine power above all of our earthly good intentions. And so first of all, I want to share and talk about American Thanksgiving. And to do this, I'm going to be reading from our son Eric the Thanksgiving reflection that he wrote and sent out to all 650 interstate battery employees at the uh, Dallas headquarters. Eric, is, Eric serves as chaplain of the company. Interstate Battery Company, and I'm very proud of what he does there, and I want to use this with his, I've used this with his permission. He writes this, he sent this out just a few days before Thanksgiving. The holiday of Thanksgiving, as we know it, began with a proclamation of Thanksgiving issued by President Abraham Lincoln in the fall of 1863. The first line of the proclamation reads thus, the year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. 
Eric writes, while undoubtedly true that the fields were fruitful and the skies full of health, the rest of the United States was engaged in a great civil war. The states were anything but united. The battles of Gettysburg and Vicksburg had just been fought, and the first 10 months of 1863 had been among the bloodiest in the history of America. It was against this backdrop that President Lincoln chose to set aside a day of thanks for, quote, the bounties which we so constantly enjoy that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. And then writing, um, the next one, then writing that the nation's many blessings should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged by the American people, Lincoln then declared this, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. Now, President Lincoln did not call the United States to rest on the fourth Thursday for football. <laughs> he didn't tell us to rest so we could do insane traveling or for Black Friday. He wanted in the Civil War's badness for his Americans to feast on the Heavenly Father's goodness and to produce hope and unity in a fragmented and violent time. So I ask us, in that same spirit, what's bad in your life? What's warring in our country now? Is there anything tearing at your family or at God's church or at our society? How about these infernal fires? Given all the problems back in 1863, what if President Lincoln had called for a national feast day of grumbling? Let's all grumble. But as a true leader, President Lincoln challenged our forefathers then and us now to dig deeply into the spiritual treasure that we have in God, who is only good, and to give, and to give thanks in all circumstances to endure, to overcome, to rebuild, to trust, smile, hope, work hard, don't give up, work together, pray together. As Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the true spirit of thanksgiving, from the pilgrim to the civil war to today. So let's share for a minute what from our beneficent good Heavenly Father are we reverently and gratefully thankful for? So I'll go first. I just love this from the mouth of babes. This past Thursday, we were all gathered at our house at our extended Thanksgiving table, all 13 of us plus newborn Esme. And all of us, adults and kids, we raised our glasses and started giving toasts for health and for family, for jobs, for being together, Yada, yada, yada. And then little four-year-old Emery pipes out, a toast for God. She said it all. President Abe would be so glad. She gets it. Above and beyond, under, surrounding, all, among all of our life problems is God. God who created us and has recreated us, who breathes unto us his spirit's power to put one foot in front of another, to see with eyes of faith, to smile in the face of the devil, laugh at his lies, and to raise hands and hearts to good God. And so we thank you, President Lincoln, for steering us back to our spiritual roots as a country of believers. Secondly, today, we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. The pyramids are white for heaven's glory. As we conclude the church's liturgical year and this final season of the year of Pentecost. Now Jesus has many titles in the Bible. You know so many of them. Just a few of them are prophet, Lord, Savior, Rabbi, Teacher, King of King, Lord of Lords for today, Redeemer, Great Shepherd, Son of God, Alpha and Omega, and so many more. And we talk about these realities of Jesus all year long. But 
like in 1863, being the modern Thanksgiving origin, the year 1922. 1922 is the hinge year for this church festival, Christ the King Sunday, into the church calendar. You see, with the smoke of World War I, the Great War, remember this? The war that is to end all wars. Remember that? With the World War I just concluding the carnage across Europe, the Roman Catholic Pope, Pius XI, issued an encyclical in December of 1922. The Pope said, there is no real peace. Class divisions and unbridled nationalism is on the rise. True peace, he proclaimed, can only be found under the kingship of Christ as Prince of Peace. And so Christ the King Sunday was officially added to the Christian liturgical calendar in 1922. And this is what the encyclical says in part. If to Christ is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all men purchased by his precious blood are under his dominion and embraced by his power, not one of our faculties is exempt. Christ, therefore, must reign in our minds to believe and to trust his revealed truths. Christ must reign in our wills to obey and not rebel from his laws of servant power. Christ must reign in our hearts to resist the tempting voices and to love God above all things. Christ must reign in our bodies so that we serve as instruments of God's justice and peace for all. You see, the Pope knew the people's war wasn't over, that false kings wanted to rule over the very people for whom battles were fought and for whom Christ was crucified, died and rose. These false kings, besides class divisions and unbridled nationalism, want to water down the gospel and Jesus. False kings want a milk toast Jesus, who only asks for fair weather Christians. This is why we need to proclaim Christ the King, King of the whole life, of our whole life, shaping our life with Christ's values and Christ's truths. We celebrate one Sunday of the year to remind us to lift up every day of the year Christ Jesus as the king of our hearts, minds, wills, and bodies. I love how the Apostle Paul says this in our text, 1 Timothy chapter 6. But as for you, man of God, Timothy, shun all of this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Paul then ties our Christ-centered lives into the power of God in Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, Paul says. Did you read in the San Luis Tribune paper yesterday the article about the church under the bridge? Some of you saw that? This is in Waco, Texas. The church under the bridge has been temporarily evicted for highway bridge expansion. It's I-35 going north-south through Texas. Hundreds of homeless people are ministered to by Mission Waco and their pastor, Dorel. Now, the TV stars of the HGTV show Fixer Upper, how many of you have seen Fixer Upper? Isn't that a pretty fun show? The Christian couple, Joanna and Chip Gaines, have offered their lawn of Magnolia Market every Sunday for the years-long construction time for this church of homeless who meet under the bridge to meet at their lawn. So the pastor thanks the Gaines for this, but then the pastor goes on to say that, quote, the church of Jesus Christ in America is in so many ways shallow. You've got to grow up. Christianity is not just about being saved. That's just the first step in a lifelong process. In other words, quote, to thank and praise our beneficent Father in the heavens, per President Lincoln, and quote, all of our faculties must be under the reign of Christ, who is the King, per Pope Pius XI, and, and quote, fill your life with Christ's hands-on ministry to all in need, going deep and not shallow in your faith, per the homeless pastor, and, quote, fight the good fight of faith 
with morals and values and habits that reflect Jesus Christ, who is our King of kings and our Lord of lords, for the Apostle Paul. So how about you? Are you shallow? Are you a fair-weather Christian? Our Christian life is not lived on the sidelines or on the bleachers. It's out in the field. It's in the trenches. It's soaking up the word of God, shouting out songs of salvation, full and free. So today, let's reflect a moment. Is Christ the king of our lives? Our faith, our daily actions? When are we shallow? Where have we abdicated to a false king? Where are we lacking? You see, first, we confess. And we confess all these things that we're satisfied with. And as we confess these, we feel pretty bad about ourselves. Like, oh my gosh, I'm getting real, and I don't like what I'm actually seeing about myself. It's at that moment when we say, I'm not doing such good a job, or I've been fooling myself, it's exactly at that moment that God's good news comes. The good news is that Jesus does what we cannot do. That's the good news. He always does. He always will. And that's why he came. He says, I am your strength. Come, live out of me. Let me fill you and you then reflect me. So how powerful. We confess first and then we turn to our graceful, good Savior for his spirit, his power, his ministry that is ours. Yea, God. So, both Thanksgiving Day, both Thanksgiving Day and Christ the King Holy Day have their origins in grief and strife and angst in our country and the world. But both of these festivals point us to gratitude and to strength, to the King of kings and Lord of lords, to God in Christ who alone is good. So let's close by saying this together. Our thanks, our great thanks, our greatest thanks, our King of kings, our Lord of lords. Amen.